welcome to the deep dive. Today we're taking a really serious look at something uh, pretty cutting edge in cognitive function. Yeah, it's an experimental compound called dihexa. Right, and if you're watching, you're probably keen to get up to speed on the latest in brain science, and well, that's what we're aiming for. Exactly, we want to pull out the key information on dihexa, see what the research actually suggests about its potential. But it's important we approach this carefully, right? Absolutely. You know, the idea of boosting brain power is appealing, but dihexa research has really been focused on um, serious neurodegenerative conditions. So we need to keep that serious analytical perspective throughout. Definitely. Okay, so let's dive in the basics first. What uh, What is dihexa? So dihexa is what's called an oligopeptide drug. Oligopeptide. Yeah, I think peptides, like small chains of amino acids, proteins are made of those. Got it, building blocks. Exactly. Now its chemical name is, well, it's a bit complex, N-hexanoic tyrile sex hex, aminohexanoic amide. Whoa, okay, that's quite a mouthful. It is, but it helps scientists pinpoint that specific molecule. You might also see it called PNB0408. PNB0408, like a code name? Sort of, yeah, an internal code used during research and development. But what's really interesting is where it comes from. Uh -huh. It's actually derived from angiotensin the four. Angiotensin the fourth, isn't that something our bodies make naturally? It is, yeah. Which is quite an unusual starting point, maybe. Huh. And it's the potential cognitive effects that have people talking. That's the main thing now, yes. Even though, like we said, the initial work was looking at helping people with conditions like Alzheimer's. Right. But the way it seems to function has sparked this broader interest in, you know, cognitive enhancement more generally. So how might it actually work? What's the thinking there? Well, the core idea revolves around how it interacts with the specific growth factor system. Dehexa acts as a... Uh, High affinity ligand for hepatocyte growth factor, HGF. High affinity ligand, meaning it binds really tightly to this HGF. Exactly, it binds very strongly. Okay, HGF, and what does that do? So when dihexa binds to HGF, it seems to boost or potentiate HGF's activity at its receptor. That receptor is called CMET. CMET, okay. And that interaction, that potentiation, is what's believed to drive the effects people are interested in. Which are? Well, it's thought to strengthen the connections between brain cells. Synaptic connectivity, we call it. Right, synapses, better connections, maybe faster, more efficient brain communication. That's the idea. Plus, it seems to offer neuroprotection, helping keep those brain cells healthy. Hmm. Stronger connections, protected neurons. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good mix for cognition. It does, yeah. And I think I read somewhere it was compared quite favorably to another factor. Hmm. Something about potency. Ah, yes. So, in animal models, dihexa showed itself to be incredibly potent in certain lab tests, neurotrophic assays. Neurotrophic assays. That's those weird. measure nerve cell growth and survival. Pretty much, yeah. And in those tests, dihexa was, uh, get this, seven orders of magnitude more potent than BDNF. Seven orders of magnitude. Uh -huh. Compared to brain-derived neurotrophic factor? Well, yeah, BDNF is, like you said, crucial for neuron health. So yeah. that difference suggests dihexa could have a really powerful effect on those pathways. Though... Maybe not necessarily better or safer, just yeah. more powerful in that specific test. Precisely. It's a lab finding, needs context. Okay, so huge potency in the lab. What effects have actually been seen in, you know, actual animal studies? The main findings are improvements in cognitive function, especially in animals' models that mimic conditions like Alzheimer's. Right. There was a study, uh, McCoy et al., back in 2013, that showed dihexa could reverse memory problems caused by scopamine. Scopamine. That drug messes with memory, right? Yeah. And they tested this out. Using tasks like the Morris water maze, a standard memory test for rodents. Interesting. And it wasn't just behavior, was it? They saw physical changes too. That's right. The same study found an increase in synapse formation, those connections we talked about, specifically in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is super important for learning and memory. Exactly. So that finding directly supports the idea that it enhances those connections. Okay, that sounds promising in animals. But what about people? Ah, uh, well, that's the big caveat. Human data is still really limited. Very limited. So these animal findings are interesting, but we're still very early in understanding how it affects humans. Very early stages, yes. That jump from animal models to humans is always a huge hurdle. Yeah, always. Okay, let's shift to safety then. Any red flags popping up? 
Well, based on what we have, which is mostly short-term animal studies and some very, very early human trials, it seems generally well tolerated. No major side effects reported in those limited contexts? Not significant adverse events, no. However, there is a theoretical concern. Okay, what's that? It's related to that CMET receptor it interacts with. Right, the one it boosts. Yes. CMET is actually a known oncogene. Oncogene, meaning it could potentially promote cancer. Under certain circumstances, yes that potential exists, so that connection has definitely raised some caution. Yeah, I can see why. That sounds serious. It is something to be very aware of. But interestingly, a patent related to Dihexa US 8598108B2, I think it's specifically noted that in their short-term safety studies, they didn't see tumor development. Even though CMET is an oncogene. Right. The thinking is, maybe, that short-term activation isn't enough on its own to kickstart cancer, which is usually a complex multi-step process. Okay, so maybe less of a concern in the short term based on that? Perhaps. But, and this is critical, we, we absolutely do not know the long-term safety profile. There just haven't been extensive human studies. Right. Long-term is a total unknown. Got it. Okay, so what about accessing it? If someone were doing lab research, where would they get it? And what's the cost like? Well, first, it's definitely not approved for human use. It's available from online suppliers that sell chemicals for laboratory research. Like places researchers buy chemicals. Exactly. You might see it listed on sites like Amazon or Swiss Chems, but strictly for research. Cost-wise, it's roughly in the ballpark of uh, $240 to $250 per gram. Wow, okay. Not cheap. Not at all. And the absolute key point here, just to reiterate for everyone watching, right. this is sold for lab research only, not for people to take. Absolutely not. It should never be used outside of a properly controlled research setting, certainly not without medical supervision, which isn't happening right now because it's not approved. Okay. Not for self-experimentation, period. Ugh. Okay, so shifting gears. If it were used in research, how quickly might someone notice effects? What's the timeline look like? That's tricky. You see anecdotal reports online, you know, forums and such. Personal accounts. Yeah. Some people claim they notice things like improved sensory perception, maybe sharper senses within just a few days. Mm, anecdotal, though. Very anecdotal. Not scientific proof at all. Actual clinical trials, when they happen, would likely measure outcomes over weeks, maybe even months, to see if there are real sustained changes. Makes sense. Need that rigorous approach. So the timeline could really vary by person, dose, Lots of factors. Exactly. Highly variable, and again, based mostly on speculation right now, not hard data for humans. Okay, so let's circle back to long-term use and risks. We mentioned the theoretical cancer link. Are there other long-term worries? The biggest worry is simply the lack of data. We just don't know what happens when it's used for extended periods in humans. Because the studies haven't been done. Right. So, yes, the potential CMET activation and cancer risk is a major theoretical concern, even if no specific cases are reported. But there are other unknowns, too. Like what? Well, consider its half-life. In animal studies, it seems to stick around for quite a while, maybe 12, 13 days after an IV dose. That was pretty long. It is. So with prolonged use, there's a potential for it to build up in the system. Cumulative toxicity is a possibility we can't rule out. Okay. Other unexpected effects over time. We just don't have the knowledge base. It interacts with a fundamental growth factor system, long-term manipulation of that could have consequences we haven't foreseen. So wrapping up, it sounds like there's definite promise shown in the early lab work in animal studies especially thinking about neurodegenerative diseases. Yes, the potential is there, based on that early research. But, and it's a huge but, the human data is extremely limited, and the long-term safety is just a massive question mark. That sums it up perfectly. There's a compelling reason to investigate it further, scientifically, understand the mechanisms, see if there are real therapeutic benefits. For conditions like Alzheimer's, for instance. Exactly. But we're nowhere near understanding its safety profile for long-term use in people. That needs rigorous, careful evaluation. And it is absolutely vital for you watching to remember, this is an experimental compound. Not for human consumption. Not intended for human use outside of controlled research. It's available for lab purposes only. Much more research is needed. We need to fully understand the benefits and the risks. Absolutely. Responsible science is key here. Couldn't agree more. Exploring leads is important, but safety and thoroughness have to come first. Well, thank you for breaking all that down. It's uh, definitely a complex but fascinating area to watch. It is indeed. And for everyone watching, if you found this deep diet helpful, please do like and subscribe to our channel. 